Our next item is related to our health committee. They will be providing us their uh, traditional update as well as their recommendations for a learning approach for the second quarter of the 2020-2021 school year. And I'll remind all of those watching and those in attendance that when we convened in July to make a decision related to uh, the first nine weeks of school, we committed at that time to establishing a health committee that would regularly monitor uh, health conditions and report to this board at each of our meetings related to those health conditions. So would like to again acknowledge the health committee uh, that was put together uh, after that July meeting with that purpose in mind. Um, for their regular and thorough updates. We also um, stated at that time and committed to um, revisiting our approach for the second nine weeks at such time as we would provide at least three weeks notice um, of any change in pathway based on the recommendations of that health committee. And so again, adopted that predominantly virtual approach with some limited in-person instruction for the first nine weeks. We have held that approach throughout the entire uh, nine weeks and intend to do so. And again, uh, fulfilling our commitment to come back to the board uh, related to health data and a recommendation on how we might proceed beyond the first nine weeks. So Dr. Teigen, I will have you begin with that presentation. I would just like to let uh, members of the board and the public know this, their presentation will be immediately followed by uh, the administration's presentation related to their health recommendation. Dr. Teigen. Thank you. Good afternoon, Chairman Cooper, members of the board, and Dr. Cashwell. I am here today with Robin Gilbert, the supervisor of School Health Services, to share the update and recommendations from the Henrico County Public Schools Health Committee. Also with us here today is Dr. Melissa Vare, who was here um, back in, I believe it was late August. And here's our agenda for today's presentation. We'll provide a quick review of the pandemic dashboard made available to school divisions just about a month ago through the Virginia Department of Health to include the Center for Disease Control and Prevention's K-12 school metrics. We will review the 14-day average data for Monday, October 19th for Henrico County, also for the surrounding localities, and I will share the Central Health District Planning Region's data. The Health Committee reviewed this data on Monday. We will share the recommendations from the Health Committee given to the Division of School Leadership and the Division of Learning to inform their work around the learning approach for the second nine weeks and beyond. Last of all, we'll highlight the next steps for the Health Committee. As a quick reminder, on Monday, September 28, 2020, the Virginia Department of Health shared the CDC K-12 school metrics, which includes a set of indicators for dynamic school decision making. This set of metrics includes two core indicators of disease transmission, which are to be combined with a third core indicator based on a division's self-assessed measure of their ability to implement the following key uh, five mitigating strategies, face coverings, social distancing, hand hygiene, and respiratory etiquette, cleaning and disinfecting, and contact tracing. In addition, there are three secondary indicators that may be used to support local decisions. Three core indicators change each day and represent a 14-day average. The secondary indicators continue to be based on the seven-day average. These core and secondary indicators are used to determine a risk of transmission in our schools. There are five levels of risk, and they are lowest risk, lower risk, moderate risk, high risk, and highest risk. And they are shown on the right side of the slide. Here are the two core indicators for Henrico. As of this past Monday, Henrico County was at a higher risk for the number of new cases 
per 100,000 persons within the last 14 days, which means the number of new cases per 100,000 persons is between 50 and 200. At the same time, Henrico County was at the lower risk for the percent positivity for the last 14 days, which means the percent positivity was less than 5%. A self-assessment at the Health Committee meeting on Monday to determine HCPS's ability to implement consistent and correct use of mask, social distancing, and hand hygiene, and respiratory etiquette, cleaning and disinfection, and contact tracing resulted in Henrico being at a lower risk if using a six-foot social distancing. I apologize. As mentioned previously, there are also three secondary indicators that can support the decision-making process in local communities. The indicators are present or percent change in new cases per 100,000 during the last seven days compared with the previous seven days. The percentage of hospital inpatient beds in the region that are occupied and the percentage of hospital inpatient beds in the region that are occupied by patients with COVID-19. The CDC does not recommend using these secondary indicators as the main criteria for determining the risk of disease transmission in our schools. They should merely support the decision making from the core indicators shown on the previous slide. Now let's look at the data from Richmond City and Chesterfield and Hanover counties I will show you the same data for Chesterfield, Hanover, and Richmond in a single slide that I just shared with you on the two separate slides for Henrico. The risk levels for Chesterfield mirror most of those for Henrico, with the outlier being the secondary indicator for the percent change in new cases per 100,000 population during the last seven days. The risk levels for four of the five indicators for Hanover also mirror those for Henrico, with the exception of the 14-day percent change in new cases per 100,000 persons is higher for Hanover than Henrico. Of the three surrounding localities, Richmond most closely resembles Henrico County in its current metrics and corresponding risk levels. The increase in new cases seen within the central region over the past few weeks have resulted in the transition back to high burden with substantial transmission. The trend is increasing, which means the increase has continued for 14 consecutive days. So what does this all mean when we consider next steps for Henrico County? The Health Committee determined the current risk level remained at the top of the lower risk level. This led to the following recommendations. I'm going to turn this back over to Dr. Tigan. The recommendations were to expand optional in-person learning opportunities for pre-K through 12 while continuing to offer families who do not wish for their students to engage in in-person learning the option of choosing um, virtual learning for the remainder of the school year and to phase in students whose families choose in-person learning with the priority being the, at the elementary level. Pre-K through two would transition in first to allow schools to focus on helping the youngest students adhere to the various mitigation strategies. Shortly thereafter, the students in grades three through five would transition back to in-school learning. The COVID-19 task force would monitor PPE consumption and inventory levels, starting with the return of pre-K through two. The f and they would focus on maintaining six-foot social distancing for classroom seating. 
At the elementary level, students would stay in their classrooms and not mingle with other students during the day. Breakfast and lunch would be served in the classroom. In the library, an art, music, and physical education teachers would bring their lessons to the classroom virtually. As some of our librarians and art, music, and physical education teachers serve other schools, and we want to eliminate building-to-building -building mixing. Students would transition with their class to recess, and students would maintain their six-foot social distancing on the playground, thus providing a mask break time for the students. It was also suggested to create one-way traffic patterns for students and staff to follow when moving through the building during any class changes. At the secondary level, it was suggested that the master schedule be adjusted to stagger and extend transition times to facilitate social distancing during transitions. This would result in an in-person start date for secondary students of the second semester. In addition, the recommendation was for the sixth and ninth grade students to have a few days to transition to their new buildings before the rest of the students in those buildings were to return. And as we continue to transition students from virtual to more and more in-person learning, it is imperative that the Henrico Health Committee continue to monitor the CDC K-12 school metrics and receive updates on PPE usage and supply levels and assess the effectiveness of, of all of our processes and procedures. Thus, the Health Committee would continue to meet. The committee also agreed to meet weekly for the two weeks following the Thanksgiving break and the winter break. And the superintendent would be updated after each meeting and the health committee would advise her of any needed shifts in the learning approach. And at this point, Ms. Gilbert and I would be happy to answer any questions related to the health data that was used to make these recommendations and the health committee has shared these recommendations with the Division of School Leadership and the Division of Learning on Monday, allowing them to formulate a plan for the second nine weeks and beyond. The details resulting from the recommendations will be communicated by the Divisions of School Leadership and Learning in their return to school presentation that will follow this one but I'm happy to answer questions about the health data. And I might add on to what Dr. Teigen has said. As she stated, the health committee uh, arrived at their recommendations on Monday. And so the next step was that we shared that with our administrative team to take those recommendations as well as other factors in place um, to provide a recommendation uh, and proposed plan to the school board. And so that's what we'd wanna share with you next as you've heard the health committee's recommendation first. So. I'd say at this point, um, while we haven't shared the details of the proposed plans, we have heard the recommendation of the health committee, and I know they're prepared to answer questions related to the health metrics or how they arrived at that recommendation, but related to any proposed implementation, uh, we'd want to be able to share our plan with you next. Thank you, Dr. Castro. I'm going to start to my left. Uh, Ms. Ms. Atkins, you want to begin? Thank you, uh, Chairman Cooper, and thank you for your work, uh, both of you and the entire committee. I do have a few questions that I think would benefit those in the room and those watching for you to answer. And one of those is, if you could please share uh, or provide considerations for those students that um, have asthma, that may not be able to wear a mask. Can you share a little bit about how that would be handled? Yes, ma'am. If um, students have a particular condition, medical condition, then they would have documentation that would lead to a 504. If it's just a medical condition, they'd have a 504 plan that it would be indicated in there, the accommodation for um, possibly not wearing a mask if that's what the, um, the, the physician recommends and the committee you know, reviews and accepts. Same is true as we, we know we have students that, um, have, that are within our special education program that might not be able to wear masks. And so in addition, when those students um, would not be able to wear a mask, there are other uh, mitigating uh, strategies that have been employed, such as, you know, we have put um, 
desk guards in rooms, not only for our students, but for our staff. Our staff also were able to have a face mask that would provide another um, layer if there's not a desk in between where you, the desk shield is being able to provide an extra barrier. And so there, there are other um, supports to help provide um, the levels of safety within our classrooms. Thank you, Dr. Teigen. And my next question is something that's probably at top of mind for many families and, and teachers as well. And can you share a little bit about uh, what measures may be taken for the student that may refuse to wear their mask? Yes, there's, you're going to hear more about that in the next presentation. Okay. Um, Dr. Noel will come forward and he's going to share an addendum to the Code of Student Conduct that will address such issues as, um, you know, if a student refuses to wear a mask, it's defiance. Um, you know, obviously we're going to work with students, but it can get to the point where it's defiance and it becomes more of a discipline issue. But Dr. Noel will expand on that. Fantastic, and I do want to make a little bit of a note or a caveat so we know that there are some students that um, are not familiar with wearing a mask, and we're not talking about disciplinary for those no. particular students, and from a health committee perspective, certainly understand that there will be some grace uh, as well, and then if it got to the disciplinary piece that is more, you know, the operation side of the house. I just want to make sure that was shared. Correct. And I can share, share with speaking with colleagues across the region and in other divisions that have already brought students back to school. Um, while they have been pleasantly surprised at how well mask wearing has gone, because I think every one of them has a required mask um, for staff and for students. And, um, but absolutely, we, we anticipate that some of our younger students may need some additional supports along the way. And even some of our, uh, you know, kids forget. There's a difference between forgetting and refusal. Thank you, that's all I have. Thank you so much, Ms. Atkins, uh, Ms. Shea. I promise this is gonna be my briefest set of health <laughs> metrics questions today. I see Dr. Ray over there, she gets me. She's my data girl. All right, um, just uh, well, two sets of questions. So the first one is when I look at the green to red gradient, um, when we're looking at these uh, top two core indicators, can you give me an idea of the range in order to be in all of those? I, I know you mentioned that we were in orange because uh, we were between 50 and 200. So I would assume red would be more than 200. Yes. How about the other ones there? Just one second. They're okay. very, the lowest I believe is below five. Okay. Um, hold on, let me make sure. I was going to say, you have to look it up. I've got to look it up. Um, they are very, they are, are very low. Very low. Um, okay. I think it's between, and it may be, um, I thought I had it here with me, but I don't. That's, well, I can get them from you But later. I can, I will absolutely share but them with this you. This at least gives me an idea for the orange, that we're pretty much in the middle of that range. Yes, ma'am. We're not ma right there trying to tip on one side or the other. No, and it, it is, it, you know, during this week, you know, I look at the data every single day. It, it might tick up a little bit, and then it goes down a little bit. And, you know, so there is fluctuation there. And then us being in the um, light green for the uh, PCR um, is, cause you said, because we're under 5%. Correct. When you're b between 3 to 5%. Okay. Greater than or equal to 3 and up to five. So again, we're on the lower end of that range. We're not close at this time to tipping over. Correct. And then um, two questions, and you, any of the three of you can answer it. Um, just to respond to some of the feedback I have se seen, um, would you say in your professional opinions that the health data it, locally for Henrico is surging? The cases are surging. I, I think that. Ask for me. Yeah, I'll let you. I think that one's probably best answered by me. Um, thank you all for having us here. Can you hear me all right? Yes, thanks Great. for being back. No worries. 
I would say that what we're seeing in the Richmond region, in particular Richmond and Henrico, I wouldn't say a surge. I would say I'm starting to see signals that we are not, de we were decreasing. We had a nice lull, we were decreasing, things were looking downward. And then we've started to, we've started to slow or decrease and we've actually started to even maybe start hinting that we might be going in the wrong direction. So that's not a surge. That's not a steep uptick that would make me go, no, 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 hold the brakes. It's a, no, we gotta remind people and it's, it's our, our call to action from my end of things to, to remind people that don't forget, I know we're all tired of this, I know we don't wanna do this anymore, but it's more signals that we need to be making sure people are adhering. And that's what we're, then it is a particular upsurge. I know in other parts of the country they are seeing legitimate surges. Um, that's not what we're seeing locally here. And what my hope is, is because we think of the community as being the drivers for you guys, um, where we, we want to see the community as a whole start to downtrend again. But I anticipate, because people are human, that we're gonna see a little bit of back and forthing. What we don't wanna see, what we wanna be on our eyes on, is, is steep increases that aren't turning around. And that's not what we're seeing. So, so you're not seeing a steep exponential curve that I, is of utmost concern to you in terms of um, that we're about to go off the deep end into some. Right. Okay. I, I worry early. <laughs> I'm an early worrier. So when <laughs> I start to see signals that things are not continuing to go in the proper direction, I start making noise around, gosh, I'm starting to get a little bit worried. But to put that into context, that doesn't mean that we need to hit the brakes, right? I would be, I would be more worried if we were, for example, looking at these metrics, if we were continually heading upwards and turning into the red, because I remember that that orange band is pretty darn wide. So if we start to trend upwards into the red band or we start to see increases in rates of rise, then we need to start having conversations. That's not at all what we've been seeing throughout you know, the last month or two. We have seen fluctuations. I cannot emphasize enough the importance of continuing to, to, with mitigation strategies in the community, but I don't think it stops. I think in the risk balance metric, I think we can take that into account, but I don't think it's a stop. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Ms. Shea, Ms. Mrs. Ogburn. Could I, could I just stop for one second, Ms. Shea? Right that gave me an opportunity to verify that the lowest level for the total number of new cases per 100,000 to be in the lowest you know, risk level is less than five. And if it's between five but less than 20, you're in the lower band. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you, Dr. Sagan. Doc, I'm sorry, Ms. Albert. That, I'm, I'm good, thank you. Um, just a quick question. Yesterday, the CDC released yet another set of guidelines which I know makes it so hard because it changes so often. So I'm curious if any of the newest information changes anything that I know you had to make this before yesterday, or if there is anything concerning, anything we should consider as we go through the afternoon that we should adjust, especially that distancing in the 15 minute rule. I'm just curious about that. To me, I think it will just um, add a layer to the contact tracing okay. because it changes um, the dynamics. And quite honestly, uh, Ms. Gilbert was speaking with Dr. Avula this morning and there's, you know, they'll continue to keep us posted as to what that will mean as they figure it out because it's, it's new to them as well. But it, it, it will, okay, if you want to, absolutely. I'm back. Um, I, again, as, as she mentioned, as Dr. Tuggan mentioned, this is new to, this is, the recommendation is brand new, but it is not that surprising or game changing. Now remember, a lot of what we're putting into place, we've already put into place, is putting those six feet distances in and is minimizing the, the number of people any child is exposed to. So a lot of the, a lot of the holes have already been blocked. This, what I would think of this as, is this does add a layer of complexity and broadness to how we think about exposures. So it's a more, I like it because it's more conservative. It does complicate contact tracing, but I think it doesn't, it doesn't change the heart of what you've already started to put into play with regards to putting as many mitigating factors in between a child and infection as possible. 
So um, as many barriers as possible. Is that what you meant? Not physical barriers, but yes. Okay. So whether, I mean, obviously mask wearing, we're going to require of anyone that's in our buildings. And, and that, honestly, I said this to the superintendent the other day, I don't think people understand just how many kids are in our buildings now. And uh, it's, it's a thing we haven't talked about a lot, but we do have students coming back in our buildings, some of them in small groups, some of them one-on-one. -on -one. We have CTE classes going on, obviously in small numbers at, at any one time. But right now, today, we're requiring those students to wear masks, and it's working. Mm -hmm. We haven't had, you know, I know this is one thing I've heard a lot is, what if a student won't wear a mask? Well, I don't think it's been a problem so far mm -hmm. that we've experienced. Because and, you're putting multiple you know, things in One thing I think parents, I've had a number of parents ask me, what can I do to help? And, and no matter which way this goes, obviously, and, and my standard answer is get your child to wear a mask get used to wearing one yourself. And the more people would do that, the longer, the less time this all lasts for the rest of us. So it, to me, it, it's a, it's a thing I wish we, you know, hindsight's always 2020, but though, but um, I do think that we, um, we do have this going on now. We do have kids in our buildings and it's working so far. And I, and, would, yeah. I mean, I, I'm not hearing anything to the contrary. But so your recommendation in, in um, when I look at the first slide is that we extend optional in person. So for example, does just trying to Shouldn't just decipher that. what that means, <laughs> Dr. Teigen. So the first one is expand optional in-person learning opportunities. So what specifically do you mean by that? The committee was um, at the point where students whose families... Dr. Tiger, um, you speak a little closer, thank you. Yes, sir. You can move it up. You can. Um, yeah, we're, we try not to touch things. Um, we, um, the committee's recommendation was that for students in elementary level whose families wanted to opt them in to more in-person learning, that the, that option should be available. You know, and they wanted to, to phase in, so not do pre-K through five all at once. They felt like we needed a little bit of time to make sure that students were following, you know, our masks. You know, they're little, we do know that. Um, and so, you know, they might need a few more hands on, all hands on deck when the littlest ones come in, but give them a week or so and then um, be able to bring in other students. But their recommendation was that students, you know, right now with the health metrics could come back to school, but we also understand not everyone wants to, so they wanted to make sure that a virtual option was available for families who so chose that. So did the health committee oh. have, oh, I'm sorry. That's okay, I was just gonna add to, um, to answer your question. Um, the health committee provided broad recommendations that said, as we approach the second nine weeks, their um, decision was that we should factor in an opportunity to allow students to remain virtual, should that be their choice, or look at bringing kids back in person and prioritizing those young students. And what the administrative team has done is create a model uh, for your consideration that we'll be sharing with you that has more specifics about how the administration will approach the broad recommendations that the health committee has given us. Yeah, because the health committee doesn't you know, was try, tried not to say this is what needs to happen instructionally right, or in the right. classroom, just that they felt it was safe at this point to offer okay. that. But they didn't go so far, for example, as to suggest a pupil-student ratio. I mm -hmm. mean, a pupil-teacher ratio, excuse me. Sorry. No, no, but the, you know, really trying to adhere to that six-foot social distancing right. in the seating in classrooms. Okay, all right. Um, okay, thank you. Ms. Oh, Ogden, I just wanted Robin. to clarify one of the um, questions you had with, you know, how is it going with their kids and are they adhering and, and following the mitigating interventions? And while our contact tracing does show um, what our community transmission looks like as it fluctuates, I can tell you that contact tracing, we have not seen in-house spread of COVID-19. Our positive cases have been community community cases, not acquired cases within our schools. So I think thank you. that goes to show you what our staff and what our students are capable of doing. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Ms. Albert. Mrs. Uh, Kinsella? Yes, um, 
As to the small groups of students that are currently in our buildings, have they been eating? Well, I would, I think some of them actually have been eating in our school, and we also know that our students that are in the child care programs have been eating in our schools each day without some of the additional supports that we'll be providing in the classrooms. What, what additional supports will we be providing should children be eating in person? How are we going to mitigate coughs and that will happen while they're eating and having lunch? Right. Every, every um, desk is being outfitted with a desk guard that is three-sided. Um, in the next presentation, you'll get to see what that actually looks like. Um, in addition to the students having their space that will help protect them, it's also the teacher will have one for the teacher um, desk as well. And I don't know if this is for Dr. Ray or, um, or if it's even in this section, but how do we feel about aerosol spread? For example, we are eating lunch, we may cough. How do we feel about aerosol spread? Definitely. <laughs> Yeah, that one's my question. Um, I think by aerosol, you're meaning droplets, or not, dro not droplet, but airborne spread, where yes, you have the airborne, very yes. small particulate matter. CDC has acknowledged that there is some evidence that it does happen, although not commonly. And the instances where they've seen that happen have been in areas where there was, um, I think there was, I guess, it's singing or very, uh, in singing or vigorous activity in kind of smaller areas, not in terms of eating or necessarily routine daily living, but in where you have concentrated areas where for time you will have a lot. So if you were not a routine cough, like, you know, but a prolonged vigorous exercise where you're panting in a small area with other people and it's poorly ventilated, or those are the examples that they've given for where they think they've seen um, airborne transmission. So what I take from that, and I would say that we've posited that about influenza actually for quite some time, that to some degree there's some small risk that there's likely very small bits that, are, that may be contributing. We just don't have very good data to back that up. Where I take that for us is it's probably something where I would not advise that we have, you know, group exercise activities in a small space. I would not advise that we have choir or similar sorts of things in a small enclosed space. I would, you know, I would definitely lean towards good ventilation and not necessarily restricting eating activities because I don't think that's gonna provide that same, again, we're all learning as we go, but I don't, from what they've seen so far, I don't think that's gonna produce the same amount of sustained kind of. Okay. But, because, mm -hmm. but because we are still learning and we don't know, mm -hmm. I mean, it is reasonable that some people might be fearful, if you will, about being in buildings with unmasked students eating? I think, I wouldn't say it's un, un, just the unmasked students eating. I, I suspect that people will be uncomfortable about being in buildings, period. Because it's not, you know, it's not just the eating, it's any time, you know, it's all throughout the day whenever the mask isn't on, masks are imperfect. And so all of these barriers that we've talked about, they're all kind of imperfect barriers, but it is understood that they're not perfect, and we're putting many of them in place to try and minimize disease, right. or tr disease transmission. But to your end, I would say not, I wouldn't lean into just the eating part. I think in general, I suspect, and I understand right. that some people will not be comfortable being in a building. Right, and then the, the last question I have is, um, the recommendation is just based on data right now, mm -hmm. just so everyone's clear. That, but it's, if we're making decisions for the future, the recommendation today for the future on today's data, yes? Right. But yeah, today's data represents, right. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Oh, I was gonna say that, don't forget that today's data is not just today, it does represent oh, right. a period of but, time, right? right? And it does average, or it does look at the cumulative over a period of time, so it's not, it's not as, and it is not, yes, yeah, she's right, it doesn't, we will need to continue to monitor, and if things change, and if, for example, we start to see that exponential rate of rise, we will probably be in front of you again saying we need to hit the brakes. Okay, I thank suspect. you. Thank you, Dr. Bray. Thank you, Dr. Tagging. Yes, and I'd just like to repeat again that we have a, you know about 650 students in our buildings every day right now just with the child care program. And I know I stood up here last time and said we hadn't had any cases. 
We have had one student that tested positive from a family contact. Um, and from that, there hasn't been any spread within the program um, over the length of time of which we're now um, beyond the, I think we're almost at the quarantine time with anyone that had close contact. But, um, you know, so we haven't seen in our buildings, even without the um, precautions and mitigation strategies that we're putting into place. So that, that gives us hope that we're doing some things right and that our, you know, we've been able to watch and learn from our child care providers. Okay. And how many kids, how many students have we had in each of our buildings? This is probably for the next piece too, but. Um, I don't know if Dr. Hughes has any idea. We'll try to figure, we'll try to get you an okay. answer of, of that. Thank you. Thank you. That's all, Chairman. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Um, Dr. quick question. So with the poly increase in persons who are listening and watching because of the gravity and the magnitude of what decisions we will make today and, and the number of persons will be impacted and affected, can you just give a brief synopsis of um, how was the health committee comprised and um, what was the makeup? There are, um, and if you let me get my paper, I think I can tell you. And while Dr. Tygen does that, Reverend Cooper, if you don't mind, yes, I'll thank Ms. Atkins for being our representative on that committee. This is a lot of additional work and a lot of additional meetings, so we are very appreciative of you being our eyes on the ground. Thank you. Thank you. Let's see if I can pull it up on my phone. Dr. Danny Avula actually, as the chair of SHAB, um, comes every, you know, is represented at the meeting as well as various other members of the health department um, can certainly provide a list of who those are. They're, you know, epidemiologists, um, you know, they have expertise in this area, infectious disease, some individuals that work at VCU as well as um, there's a teacher on the committee, there's a school board member on the committee, and then there are some central office staff based on key positions like, um, you know, the specialist for health and PE is on the committee and able to represent the, um, you know, our LAMPS teachers, our library arts, science, art, um, music, and PE. And so um, those, that pretty much comprises it, along with Ms. Gilbert and myself. Was there anyone on the committee that has a mental health background? Yes, Ms. Vitek. Thank you. And mm -hmm. I think it's important that, you know, we, we talk about the, the complexity of the committee as far as the expertise and the many different lenses that we distill the information to derive the recommendations. So I appreciate that. Um, you answered the question I had in regards to the number of um, children in our child care, so thank you for that. Uh, I think Ms. Shea has a redirect to Dr. Tiger. Ms. Shea? Yeah, just briefly, I wanted you to repeat what you had just said because I think it is so, so important. And so we had a positive case in our child care facility in one of our schools. It was um, contracted in the, from family in the community, in the community outside the school. Once it was found positive, that whole, any of the students that that child came into contact were, with were quarantined, as well as three adults or some small number of adults that came into contact, correct? Yes, they were, they were quarantined and those, out in an abundance those students, of caution. Those students were eating lunch there. They were following the same protocols that we would be asking our kids in the building to yep. follow without some of the plexiglass and extra things we've added. Ma'am. And please repeat, how many additional cases were contracted from that original case in the building? Zero. Zero. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Shea. Dr. Tigan, thank you so much. Thank you. Um, back to cash flow. Uh, thank you again to our health committee, uh, all who are present here and those who are not present with us today, but as was mentioned, have been a part of this ongoing effort and will continue to keep us up to date in monitoring health conditions um, so that regardless of what path we take forward, we can remain up to date on the latest health metrics and be responsive to that as we need to be.